I'm going to start with the question of why science communication, right? Why would you want to do a master's in science communication? Well, some of it has to start with, well, why would you want to do science communication in the first place? Um, how many of you are coming from a science background? Is that everybody? Okay. This is typically <laughs> the types of students who come to us. I mean, we have occasionally people coming from other disciplines, humanities, English, something along those lines. But in general, it's science students who are going through their science degree and think, you know what? I love science, but I don't want to spend my time in the lab. Right? I'd rather do something else that is science related. Uh, and that's actually my case as well. Uh, I have my PhD in molecular evolutionary genetics. I taught in, at American University in Washington, DC in the biology program for five years before deciding, you know what, I don't want to spend my time in the lab either. Uh, I'd rather be talking about science with people or uh, trying to understand how science is communicated through various forms of media, which is what my research is on. So that's often why people go into science communication. They have a love of science and they don't want to do science, but they want to talk to people about science. One of the reasons why we need science communication is that science has a very complicated relationship with society in many ways. Right? In some ways, it can be a very good complication, but in other ways, when we talk about scientific controversies, it can be a sort of problematic element as well. Right? So we need people who are specialized in talking with the public about science. And, and it's important that I said that word with, because with, uh, is how you have to think about talking with the public. One of the first things, and the current and former students here can attest, um, we don't treat the public as if they are some separate entity who's just you know ignorant masses that we throw science at. Or one of the things you learn doing science communication is you have to you know engage with the public on those sort of topics. From a sort of practical spec perspective, why would you want to get an MSc in science communication? Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about what you gain from doing the masters at a sort of pragmatic level uh, in terms of if you want to do this as a job, um, if you want to work as a science communicator. Even three, four years ago, when students ask me that question, I'd be like, well, you could try and do it on your own. It's gotta be really highly motivated. Um, nowadays, most jobs are looking for someone who has a master's already. So whether you do this master's program or some other master's program, if you want to work as a science communicator, you will have to get a, a, a master's degree in science communication. Again, you can try it on your own if you want to be um, sort of a freelance science communicator, but that requires a lot of work on your part, a lot of motivation on your part to actually keep uh, trying to create events and, and you know do going the freelance route. But if you want a job at an organization, um, or even if you want to become an outreach officer or something like that, at this point, the competition is getting much harder. Uh, and most jobs, if you don't have a master's, they won't uh, even look at you at this point. I wish it wasn't the case, but um, it's kind of where we've come over the last three or four years. So what types of, you know, when we say what is science communication, communicating with the public, but there is a vast range of ways in which you can do science communication. And in this program, we talk about all these different ways. So on the left here, we have sort of traditional sort of notion of working with the public um, talking about issues related to science policy. Right? So we have specialists in science policy who talk about well, how do you deal with the public and engage with them on issues related to science uh, controversy. But we also have, again, what you would call some traditional outreach um, elements as well. Doing events with school children or doing events at museums. Now, you can also do events with adults that are just about doing outreach between a scientific organization uh, and the public. But you also can have science communication at the level of public relations. And as 
James mentioned, for those who saw him talk about uh, Leo Wong, PR has become a, a sort of big way in which um, many of our science communication students get uh, jobs, whether it's traditional PR or a lot of them now go into medical writing uh, as well. And then you have sort of traditional science journalism, uh, which, you know, newspapers, popular science magazines, but now more often is related to um, online writing. Uh, you also have theater, which you can see there. Um, museums, science museums and science centers are one way in which science communication students can get jobs and we have courses uh, a course specifically on that, and then mass media, whether it's your traditional science documentary or natural history film, or again, the online world of making shorter YouTube videos, um, either for an organization or for uh, independently. Uh, and probably can't see that, that's me there. Uh, we also deal with the level of entertainment and fiction. So my research is on science and entertainment, and there I'm on the set of the Big Bang Theory uh, because the guy who is their science consultant is a, a friend of mine. And I've done, well, I've written about the, um, him as well. So lots of different ways in which you can be exposed uh, to science communication. Um, so this shows, uh, James gave you the potential jobs at the end, I'll talk about them at the beginning, some of where our graduates have gone on to work. Uh, one of our former graduates here is Ikra uh, Chaudhry. She is doing a PhD with us, and in fact two of the students last year are doing PhDs uh, with us. But I will say that most of the students from the group from last year have ended up doing something that is science communication or health communication related or doing something with medical writing. Uh, this includes the previous year's group as well. So you can see lots of uh, avenues to go down uh, after you get your MSc in science communication. So, um, one student from last year actually just became the research communications officer for the MS Society. Um, previous student, again, doing stuff with science policy, but we also have some doing things at the Science Museum, TV production, um, some working as uh, uh, in the press office at organizations like Cancer Research UK, uh, one working for the World Wildlife Fund, some has become a, a podcast producer, Again, working for these scientific societies, filmmaking, outreach, medical writing. Okay, there's a wide range of jobs that you can get after doing your MSc in science communication. Now, in terms of um, in terms of our science communication program, what do we emphasize? Well, kind of the philosophy we go. The philosophy that went into designing this program in terms of how we try to teach science communication, we believe that essentially one sentence can change the world, right? And it can certainly change the world for particular people. And science communication, because science is so powerful, can have that impact as well. So when you are designing your science communication products and, and events, you have to be very careful about how you craft those sentences, right? You have to think about the communication that you're doing. Okay, so that involves, of course, learning skills, but it also involves thinking about the nature of science, the nature of science in society, and the nature of science communication itself. So the way in which we approach the teaching of science communication is a combination of um, theoretical elements and practical elements. And some of this emerges from conversations that um, I've had with a guy named Andrew Cohen, who is the uh, head of BBC Science documentary 
uh, uh, of that unit. And he's a graduate of our university. He, was, he came from our faculty, he was, a, he was a biologist. And so he wanted to see us develop a science communication program. And he told me, well, look, I don't need you to teach these students skills. I was like, how to operate a camera? We teach people that, and that's the easy part. What we really want you to teach them is those critical thinking skills, how to think about science more critically, right? how to play science in society. Because if you do that, then they can tell better stories about science. And that's far more important than whether or not they can operate uh, a television camera or a movie camera. So that's the basis of our uh, program. Um, yeah, so it's a problem thinking uh, approach. It's also based around the idea of looking at the science communication literature, what studies have been done on this. And that is important because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Right? Chances are someone has thought about something that you want to do before. And you don't want to just say, well, I'll do it based on you know, what I think should be happening when someone might have studied that particular thing and found, yeah, the way you're gonna approach it actually doesn't work. Right? So paying attention to science communication research uh, is important. Okay, so I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about the structure and then give our current students and, and ICRA a chance to you know, talk to you and give you a chance to ask me questions and them questions. Uh, but in terms of the questions you might have, the structure is probably one of the more important ones. Um, what do we actually do in this course? Um, the most important course in the first semester is your introduction to science communication course, where again, we talk through um, what it is that we've learned about science communication. You do some assessments. Um, that have science communication built into them in terms of the last assessment they did was writing a blog article. You also have two other courses, Introduction to Contemporary Issues and in, in STM. Uh, that course is a history of science, technology and medicine course, and essentially that's giving you some ways of thinking critically about science, understanding how we got to the relationship we have now uh, between science and society. And then there's a third course called Communicating Ideas um, that's worth 15 credits. Um, and that course is evolving, so based on feedback we've had from past students and current students. Um, but the general idea is to get you thinking how to you know, craft good written pieces. So it's academically based within the first semester, although um, I try to push the students in that first semester to start thinking about the projects that they have to do in the second semester and over the summer. During the second semester, you will have um, essentially two of these four courses where you are assessed. But you are eligible to sit in on all four courses uh, if you would like. Um, it's not, a, they're, all, they're all running on Mondays. I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, in a second. You choose two of these. You also do what's called a science communication research project. This is a project that's based on original research you do uh, on a particular topic of science communication. And again, I'll, I'll give a couple examples in a, in a bit. And the other thing you do, and it's the primary um, component, is the mentored project. This is where you work with a science communication professional in order to craft a science communication product that should be usable by the science communication mentor. That runs over the summer, but um, we try and arrange the mentors at least by the middle of the second semester, if not earlier, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, you can do, you have your official mentor project, but there's no reason you can't work with that science communication professional on other areas. You can volunteer with them to do other things as well. Part-time study, if that's what you're interested in, essentially it's split over two years. You do the intro course in semester one. You choose one of those four courses in semester two. Research project over the year of summer one. Uh, 
Semester three, you take those two 15 credit courses, you choose the other of those four courses, and then you do your mentor project. And as James mentioned, um, in terms of having a part-time job, the ways in which, the days in which the courses run is this one's run on Tuesdays all throughout the semester. This one is run on Mondays, but half the semester, weeks seven through 12. And this one runs on Wednesdays, weeks one through six. So essentially throughout the first semester, you have to be there for two days uh, out of the five day week. These courses all run on Mondays. Um, so that's the only day you have to be in. Although for the communication research project, you have to meet with your supervisor at various points. Okay, so what are these, what we call day courses? These are courses that run from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. across a Monday. They run for three different days. So the Science, Media, and Journalism course will run through three days. Uh, it's not three consecutive Mondays. Essentially, they're spaced out. Um, well, once, well, once every four weeks, essentially, is when, you, when they will run. The reason we run them as day courses uh, is that we are bringing in professional guest speakers from the world of science communication. And if you're bringing someone in to do that, you don't just want them there for an hour. Right? You want them to interact with the students. You want them to uh, be able to engage with them at various ways. So for example, the Science Media and Journalism course, which is, is the one that I uh, run um, for this coming uh, year, for this spring year, we have the science editor from BuzzFeed coming in, um, someone who used to be the science editor at The Guardian, but also uh, a sort of award-winning documentary filmmaker, the woman who runs the science unit for BBC Radio, uh, a TV producer who's made a bunch of shows, and a woman who used to run Film 4, right? So if we're bringing them in, we want them to interact with you, and we do a number of um, activities where you talk to them about how would you pitch a story, for example, and then they work with you and give you advice on how to do that. So these all run across Mondays. Whichever ones you don't take, you can actually sit in and audit. Um, the museums and public events, again, guest speakers are brought in. The science government public policy one also brings in guests, but uh, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, that's another member of staff who, who runs those. And then science communication research, if you're interested in going on and doing more science communication research, um, we talk about the sort of skills there. Um, again, you might have questions about the mentor project. Well, let's start with the science communication research project. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the ideas is that you just take a, uh, a topic in science communication and do some research on it with a member of staff. Then you're not doing it on your own. The member of staff will help you to craft what would make for a good research project. And these are just some of the ones that happened over the last uh, couple of years. Um, looking at zoos and public attitudes, promoting lifestyle interventions and in chronic diseases, uh, looking at museums, so doing visitor studies as well, um, looking at how science is communicated through pub quizzes, women in science fiction television, or the notion of physics, celebrity, and social media. So these are the types of projects that you could do with that. Um, and these, well, the current students could say maybe the ones they're thinking about. I mean, Icarus could talk about the one that she did last year. And then in terms of the mentors projects, uh, again, these are ones that we had people do over the last two years. We actually work quite a lot with the Catalyst Science Museum, the Manchester Museum, the Museum of Science and Industry. But, um, this year, a lot of people are not as fond of museums, but there's plenty of other things that you can uh, do. Um, someone made a brochure about healthy eating. Someone made an autism guide for the Manchester Museum. But other students have worked with TV producers to come up with proposals. In one case, the documentary, the filmmaker uh, is pitching her proposal to the one show, trying to actually get it, get it made. Um, Outreach events, exploring the science of magic, and this is the one Ikra did, was the uh, producing a podcast series about women in STEM. 
And the goal is for the professional to use these. And I would say of the students last year, there was only one student um, who didn't actually have their product used by the professional. All of the students, uh, they went into rotation, uh, what, whatever it is that, that they were. Yeah, I think that was all I had to say about the uh, program. Maybe the other, other things I could say is we also have a lot of other additional things that emerge throughout the semester, throughout the year, um, types of science communication events that we can direct you to. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities to be involved in science communication. We have the science busking program. Um, the Manchester Science Festival happens every October. And a lot of students get involved in doing those types of things. Uh, yeah, so if you guys wanted to say something, we have Allison and Meredith who are currently on the course uh, at the moment. So maybe you guys could talk a little bit about you know, what drew you to science communication, what's your impression so far. Um, and then you guys can ask them questions and Icar, you can talk about your experiences. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my name's Allison. Um, I went to uni here to do my undergrad in genetics and then I had a few years out and um, then I decided that I, yeah, I always knew from like my second year that I didn't want to work in a lab um, in uni and I did a, my project in final year was science media so I already had a bit of experience in it um, and I decided yeah that I wanted to do this um, and it's helping me decide what I want to do in science communication. <laughs> Um, I'm Meredith. I did geology for my undergrad and like Allison and mostly everyone else I just did not want to work in a lab and I felt like I was more creative than that um, and I'm mostly interested in the journalism and science writing aspects of science communication. Um, it's something that I've learned in this course um, through my peers is that you don't need to know exactly what you want. Basically no one knows what they want to do and that's what's so nice about this course is that it's very comprehensive and very fluid um, so you do get to the chance to try out everything and really get a sense of what is really the best fit for you. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, for, I mean, like for the mentored projects, a small percentage of people come in and say, yep, this is what I want to do. And, uh, you know, a slightly larger percent come in and say, well, I know which area I want to work in, but the bulk of people just come in and say, this is what I'm here for, I don't know. You know, let's work to figure out what we want, you know, what might be the thing to do. Um, yeah, agree, do you want to tell them? Um, cool. uh, well, I did my undergrad uh, in physiology at Newcastle University um, and like the other guys I, I realized I actually do quite like being in the lab but not as much as I liked doing science communication so I was the science editor um, on the newspaper and I realized I probably spent more time editing the science section than I did on a, a lot of my assignments so I thought maybe there's something in that um, and for me I didn't really know how to get from um, the lab to to doing science communication uh, and that that's what drew me to the masters um, and then so I think I had a clear idea of what I wanted to do when I went in uh, to, to the Masters and I thought, um, okay, I think I want to go into journalism, I think I want to go into science writing. And it exposes you to so many different types of science communication that you really have your eyes open to everything that's out there. Uh, and so now I'm ending up doing like a PhD project in uh, science and diplomacy and, and policy uh, in relating to Antarctica of all places, um, which is fascinating and wonderful. Uh, but the one thing I do, say to everyone who takes the course is that always keep an open mind because there's so many amazing opportunities out there and you never know where you want to end up or where you will end up but uh, you just learn so much on the course and I'd recommend it to anyone really. Yeah. yeah so at this point you guys can ask us questions. Sorry, you're describing it. Alison, what did you do in between? Was it related? Um, it wasn't related, actually, no. It was actually, it was one year. It was one year, but yeah, I didn't, I, I had an unrelated job, but um, just deciding what I wanted, and then I realised that I did want to come back and do something more in depth. Do any of you have jobs on site to fund your masters? Um, I did. Uh, no, no. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I worked alongside uh, my masters. Um, I would recommend not working more than sixteen hours a week. Uh, I say that because I did that and it, it wasn't fun. Um, I think so long as you're you're fine with managing your time, it's perfectly doable. Uh, a lot of people in my year 
and I think in, in the year below, uh, in your year as well, do tend to work alongside the masters. Uh, I know that the postgraduate loan alone doesn't cover all your living expenses, so everyone tends to, to do a bit of part-time work alongside it, um, and it, I think it's, it's perfectly doable. Uh, I would just say don't work too much or too hard. Yeah, I'd, I'd say m many of the <coughs> do part-time work. Um, if you are doing more, like I said, than 16 hours, um, then you may want to consider the, the part-time, which we do have a couple of part-time students every year. Um, and some of them actually can't quite work full-time, but you know, work four out of the five days, and then they come in for the days they have to. And especially over the second semester where the courses are concentrated on a Monday, and then it's your, you know, your, your research project uh, where you can arrange meetings with advisors for whenever you want uh, to arrange the meetings for so that you can, yeah, get a part-time job over that time period. And then hopefully, um, occasionally there are sort of science communication jobs that come up during the year that are temporary. So for example, well, Hannah last year, but also um, one of our students this year, Sully, is working as a presenter at the Catalyst Museum over the weekends. And so he's getting paid for, for that. I suggest probably at the beginning of the year, get a scope of what you think the work will be for you individually, and then decide from there how many hours you want to work. Because I know some people who took off too much outside work, and then some people who realize that they do have a lot of free time. Um, and it takes a while to gauge how much you'll really be spending in the classroom and on work. So just get a sense of that. At the very least, kind of what I'm doing is I have a very minimal blogging job for the school right now, and then in the winter, um, I'm probably going to pick up another job once it's down to just one day a week. Any other questions? Do you have um, now have you started plans for what you want to do afterwards and maybe occur as well? Um, yeah, I mean I, I initially was thinking of maybe going into medical communications and I haven't like completely shut that avenue down. I'm doing a bit of freelance work for um, one of the agencies that one of the girls from last year is now working at. Uh, but I'm thinking more along the lines of sort of like policy um, and maybe even staying in academia for a postdoc. So I'm, I'm once again keeping my avenues pretty open, but I think I'm probably going to end up uh, doing something in, in policy and engagement uh, at the end of this, maybe even in science diplomacy, depending on how Brexit goes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that. Um, but yeah, how about you guys? Um, I think I, I, when I first came into it, I knew that like I liked science writing, and actually um, from a lot of the kind of lectures and things that we've done to do with museum work. I've actually decided that I am quite interested in that. So now I'm kind of, kind of, my options are between basically like writing in science and working in museums. So it has opened up more options for me actually. And I'm kind of in limbo right now. I came in with a really strong opinion that I wanted to be a science journalist, but right now that's kind of up in the air because there is so much to learn. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to give it time, take more classes, learn more things, and then develop a stronger idea as I go, which I think is what most people end up doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say that by the end of the Masters, um, n nearly everyone that I spoke to uh, had something lined up before we'd finished our dissertations. Uh, so people had a strong idea by semester so three, like over the summer, who were applying for jobs. And um, there's a really strong support system in terms of the careers uh, advice here as well. But people had ideas of what they wanted to do. There's a lot of medical writings focused in and around Manchester. Um, and there's loads of jobs down in London as well. So by the time we'd finished up, and handed in our dissertations, people would be having a couple of weeks off and then starting a job in public engagement or um, uh, so Paddy's working at the Institute of Environmental Sciences. We've got a really good mix. There's a couple of people working in museums, uh, lots of people working in sort of uh, publications officer, sort of like press officer roles. Um, Georgie's working in policy. Um, so there's like a really good mix of, of what people decided to go into. But I think by sort of halfway through semester three, people had plans lined up for, for what was gonna happen afterwards yeah I mean from from my perspective um, the British hiring system is a bit different than the one in America where in America you don't ask for references after you've given the person the job which is the way it happens here um, you ask for references beforehand so here when someone asks me for a reference you know it's like woohoo they got a job <laughs> it's not that I have to say hey they're the best ever it's like well well often I can but 
like, well, okay, I know they got in the job, so it's 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 not work in a sense when I when I get those emails and um, from last year, yeah, we got quite I get quite a few of those sort of emails. Can you write me a letter? Yeah, okay, good, you got a job. Any other questions? Anything about the course or assignments? Like, don't be shy. Yeah. So, there are deadlines for applying. Um, the deadline uh, is like June first. Um, although, you know, we, we could always, if you really want to go and you can come in June, we could, we could talk to you about it. However, there is a cap to the number of students that we take on the program, um, and based on the number of applications I've gotten already, by June we may have actually kind of filled our quota for that. You don't want too many people on the master's program because some of it's seminar based and <clears throat> if you get too many people it's hard to, to do that type of style. But yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there is an interview, um, but essentially it's either me or my colleague Elizabeth Toon uh, who would, you know, ask you various questions. And the point of the interview, well, I mean, there's a couple of points. One, you can ask more questions to me if, you know, if it's not clear what, what the program is. Uh, but also, you know, are you a good fit? We need to sort of see that, you know, are you just, you know, maybe you're not really cut out for this type of thing but it's also for me to say well is this a good fit for you right i mean that you know um sometimes i'll interview someone and say well i don't think this is really what you want to do i think you know you're better off going and trying this other thing um but yeah so there is a, a an interview which is hopefully not too scary i don't know yeah, it's more it's of an informal chat really yeah, it's it's yeah. it's over skype and i i worry like i scare people <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, just because I'm a little bit unsure of um, what I want to go to, so let me check it out. Okay. Things available. But, um, you know, you were saying like, about um, like, it's not teaching you how to work the camera, because I'm, like, I'm quite interested in like, the visual side of yeah. like, production, like telling stories. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing is with the mental project, so uh, the course mm. structure has changed slightly from when I did it, so w these guys will be doing that course structure. But for us, um, our mental project was in the second semester, and it was only worth 30 credits. And I think it's really great that they've changed it, so now you can you have the entire summer to focus on it, and it's actually worth more. So if you chose uh, to do something visual, uh, they'd find someone working in that field for you, uh, and then you'd have a chance to actually make something, uh, and that would not only work towards your your masters. Um, and it, it, the the one thing I always say to these guys as well is if you put the work into the mentor project, you do really well, um, and it's great for like boosting your grade up. Um, but at the same time, it's a chance for you to go make some contacts in the field that you probably want to work in. So I know that one of the guys from our year uh, worked in a medical communications agency for his mentor project to see whether or not medical writing was for him, uh, and now he's working uh, in medical writing. Um, so it's a really good way to sort of test the waters, but also to, if, if you already know what you want to do, yeah. to like get, have a chance to, to have like something in, on your portfolio to then show to prospective employers as well. Um, so. Yes, and I would say for, I mean, if you're interested in doing something visual, yeah. again, last year, two of the students did mentor projects based around YouTube yeah. videos, and one worked with a science communicator who's done a lot of YouTube videos, so someone, you know, that's what, one of the things that's part of her science communication portfolio. One of the students worked with the <coughs> University of Manchester's promotional team, and, you know, she only had to do one video as part of the mentor project but you know like i said if you want to do more and the mentor is willing to do more i think she created what three or four and yeah. she was involved in and she storyboarded uh, a bunch of them and then they you know let her do mm -hmm. filming and things like that and two students worked with these science documentary filmmakers um and in both cases but in one case more than the other she just volunteered on a lot of his projects and got experience that way um, doing that sort of thing. And she didn't ultimately go on and do that. She did science policy where she mm -hmm. went. Georgie did this, but she got a lot of experience doing that. And 
I mean, one student this year, um, I've already hooked him up with the mentor because he's just like, I wanted to start now doing it. Uh, and it's the same one George worked with this, this producer. Yeah. Makes sense, definitely. Um, yeah, I was looking at like, doing something similar like with visual. I was just wondering, like, with the, um, the projects at the end, would like, we be expected to go and find the person or is it unique? Are they, is it like external that you like introduce to us? Yeah, um, so essentially we have a, a database of people that we can hook you up with and some of it is, and we just had this conversation with, with the current group a couple of weeks ago, just sort of thinking, well, what are you interested in? Um, and that's more, that, that can help me then say, okay, if this is what you wanna do, on the list, I know these people would be the people to sort of talk to you about. Um, but no, you don't have to. If you do come in with someone that you want to work with, that's actually fine. Uh, uh, there are a couple of students where that happens, where they have worked with a group. So for example, um, with this year, Holly, she's worked with this group called Guerrilla Science. And she's like, well, I, can I do it with them? So yeah, fine, that's great. You know, um, You've worked with them before, it'll make it easier. And last year, a couple of people did you know, uh, do that type of work. So no, we're not going to force you to go. Yeah. Also, yeah. other than the interview, what uh, else is included in the application? Um, your transcript, got to fill in a form. You need two letters of reference, uh, preferably from academic sources. But um, you know, you can get someone from your job. I mean, you know, if your part-time job is working as um, a waiter. You have to sort of say, well, what what do I what do, are they going to say about me, really? I mean, you might be the best waiter in the world, but it might not speak to your ability to you know to write or think that type of thing. Not to any great waiter, but the, you know, it's it's a different type of skills that you're bringing to that than you would bring to a master's program. Uh, but you know, if you're working at some job where you do a lot of writing or you interact with the public a lot, you know, customer service or something like that, that's fine. Uh, so two references, transcript, form, and then you write a personal statement. Uh, the personal statement is important in two ways. One, it gives me a sense of how you write um, to see if you actually can communicate. Uh, that's not to say you have to have a perfect writer when you come in because I think that's the fear everyone has um, that you guys can speak to as well. That first essay Everyone's just like, oh no, it's, you know, it's gotta be perfect. Where it's like, well, it's your first essay in a course where you're writing a lot of things. By the end of the course, you'll be much better uh, than you were going in. But I can at least see, you know, can you articulate, you know, reasons why you want to do a science communication course? Uh, and then the second would be, yeah, showing your motivation. Why do you want to do this course? Um, what interests you about science communication? So those are the, um, yeah, that's it. And then you, then you have the interview. Yeah, I, mean, I found like if you have like a genuine interest in it, then it kind of kind of flows organically. Like you don't have to like, you know, if you have an in, in genuine interest in it, that kind of is enough really. Like in the interview, when you talk, if you talk about what parts of science communication you generally like, if you like reading popular science, if you like looking at articles online, like just talk about that. Don't overthink it too much. Just be honest, really. Well, yeah. Is there any chance for the third entry? Uh, there is a chance for deferred entry, so um, I think it's one year. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. yeah. yeah so you you can have that. Although I think they require I don't know like a store they require a deposit or something. Oh. The university requires something I think. Yeah. But um, if that's something you're interested in, just email I'm on the card. They've got the postgraduate office email address, and they can they'll let you know that type of thing better than I okay. know. Um, but I know one student who was going to start this year deferred until next year. Yeah. Did any of you look at other places, and if so, why did you choose here? 
I applied to, what do I say, six or seven schools across the UK, and I selected this one. One, because of the mentored project being the highest weight and the most personalized, because I feel like work experience, not to say that the classroom isn't beneficial, but work experience with a professional is the most useful thing you could probably have as a young adult. Um, so that was the one thing, and also because there was a specific class about media and journalism, and I didn't see that in any other school I applied to. And Manchester School. <laughs> And they interviewed with me, and that was exactly. that was the draw, right? Really. Um, <laughs> uh, for for me, it was like a mixture of financial reasons and academic reasons. So I had a look at all the courses across uh, the UK, and automatically London was out because I can't afford to live in London. Um, but on top of that, uh, like I'm, I'm from Manchester originally, so my mum was like, "Hey, move home," and I was like, "Yeah, that'll save me money." But on top of that, like like Meredith said, there's a lot of stuff that you do here that you don't see anywhere else. So um, in the first semester, I went down to London uh, and I ran into a bunch of the MSc students from Imperial. Um, now that course, I think, has been running for a lot longer, but it's a lot more academic in a lot of ways. So they do a lot more theory and they were quite surprised by how much, how many opportunities we had to volunteer and get involved with local museums. And, and also, you know, I was still going around the UK doing all sorts of SciComm things and, and going to uh, science writing things as well. Um, so for me, it was, it was a mixture of of all the opportunities and being from Manchester I knew that there are all these museums here, there are all these opportunities for amazing volunteering and, and outreach and stuff like that. So um, I'm biased but I'd say Manchester's the best <laughs> course really. Um, yeah, I think I think that's I don't know, I agree with that though. I feel yeah. like I looked a little bit but I, I was already here because of my undergrad, so it was that was partly the reason. But then I did look at other places in the UK and it did seem it was to me, did seem like the best course. Yeah, I mean, I know we've got a lot of international students this year and last year. Um, one of the other uh, student from last year who's doing a PhD came over from Canada and she said that Manchester was the, the best course that she could find in the UK. Um, and she really liked the history element that it had to it as well, because she majored in history of science. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, Jorge from Spain uh, and he preferred this course to the ones in London. Um, and what you said about history of science as well, I just want to say like, if you're doing like science communication, like that's one thing that kind of surprised me that you do learn a lot about the history of science and the history of how science and the public has interacted and it's really interesting number one and it really does help you kind of talk about science from a different perspective because that's something that even scientists who want to talk about science may not know about properly and it really is useful for what you want to do usually. Yeah. I mean, one of the speakers who's coming in the second semester last year said that she took a history of science course and that helped her be a much better, that's like the course that was the best course for her journalism. And I was like, yeah, yeah, just say, you know, can I put that on a plaque, you know, put that up? Because some students are like, well, why do we gotta do this? Well, because it actually, it helps you really think about science in different ways and how, what good stories are about science as well. Yeah, I think the history module as well is the best way to transition from writing lab reports and writing as a scientist and then learning how to write in a completely new and different way. Uh, so it's quite daunting at first because you think, oh my god, I've never written a history essay before. But it teaches you the style and the flow and the kind of, um, that way to tell a story. Um, but it really does help with everything else. Yeah. Any other questions? Some of you have been here for two hours. <laughs> HSDM. Um, well, if you have any other questions, uh, certainly you can contact me and you know, I'm sure our current students or former students, we can put you in touch with. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if anyone's thinking about doing part-time, I can put you in touch with one of the part-time, uh, either one of the current students or one of the previous students. Mm -hmm. Shahar would be happy to chat. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, then uh, like I said, contact me if you would like and sign the little sign-up sheet and I can let everyone know about various things.